this week on The Laura Flanders Show, Naomi Klein, author of The Shock Doctrine and This Changes Everything, discusses her most recent book, No Is Not Enough, plus a short report on water protector Red Fawn Fallis, who faces a life sentence for her participation in the Standing Rock protests, and a few words from me on the Labour Party manifesto, a forward-looking political agenda that just attracted a surge of UK votes. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Welcome. Naomi Klein is out with a new book, No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Want. Naomi, welcome back. Glad to have you. Thanks, Laura. It's I'm waiting for the book that you. has yes as big on the yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I, I, I don't like that when you look at it from far, all you see is no, because that's the opposite <laughs> of the message of the book. It's a really important insight in this book, which has to do with the story we tell about capitalism. It's mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. No longer the lifting of all boats. Can you mm -hmm. just start there and talk about the implications of that? Well, I mean, we are in this moment where the, 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 the ascendant moment for the so-called free market project is in profound crisis. And in truth, it's been in crisis for a long time. It's been a kind of slow crisis with various stages, right? Um, you know, I, I, it was in crisis really since the since the, the, it no longer became possible to, to negotiate a free trade agreement with the consent of all the countries involved. Lots of, lots of people would say it is crisis. It, that it is crisis, absolutely. Um, but I think there was a period from you know the 80s and 90s. Let's just say you know the the Reagan Thatcher moment through to um, you know through the through the Clinton era maybe up until like the Seattle 1999, where there was still this, the promise uh, was, and the propaganda of just like, we need more capitalism and that's what's gonna fix it, right? Like we need to deregulate markets further, we need to privatize everything, um, we need to lock it all in with these corporate free trade deals. And that, that in yeah. so doing, you would, we'd raise all boats. Yeah, that it was gonna spread around the world prosperity for everyone, um, that, that, that phase of bringing in the, you know, every corner of the globe into this singular project. Um, you know, that is what ha has been in crisis, and it's been in crisis because for a long time it was largely at the level of promise. Like, if we do this, then this will happen. But now we're in a moment where there's a mountain of data, uh, you know, thanks to, you know, theorists like Thomas Piketty who have shown us, you know, so dramatically uh, how inequality has widened everywhere that these policies have been adopted, and lived experience, right? Um, and 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 so that crisis, I think, has been building now for a couple of decades. But the 2008 financial crisis, watching the powerful break all of their rules in broad daylight, right? Intervening so dramatically in the market, doing all the things that they said couldn't be done. Um, everyone saw that, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. You understand that you, that that um, you know the rules can be broken. So the other aspect of this is that the story about lifting all boats is up against a scenario, a reality where I think the last story I heard today was five people, five men, have between them the, the wealth equivalent to half the rest of the population, the rest of the world's assets something like $400 billion. So what you say yeah. in the book is that we replace that story of capitalism will help everybody with the story of it's winners and losers and you don't want to be a loser. Right, right. What does and that Trump, Trump, I mean that? And that is key to understanding yeah. Trump because he's, what he has been selling in this period as the wealth gap has widened, um, this period of you know a, a small group of super winners and and a whole lot of, of people who are just losing, right, um, is I will teach you how to be a winner, right? Like that's, I think it's really important to understand that that is what he has been promising since he 
wrote the art of the deal. Yeah. Like, I'm going to teach you how to be like me, never mind that my wealth is inherited, never mind that everything was handed to me. And, you know, this is what he sells at, was selling at Trump University. I'm going to turn you into the next Donald Trump University, right? Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, that's what The Apprentice was, yeah. right? Uh, and this ticket into, it, up to the promised land, up the elevator to Trump Tower, right? And, and it was precisely because of the, 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 the alternative to that was getting worse and worse that that was such a, uh, such a, uh, a helpful sh sales pitch for him. And you make the point that he's not the explanation for us being in this situation, but he is an expression of it. But we all live in this ranking, rating world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with enormous implications, I think, among other things, for organizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you see yeah. it playing out? Well, you know, when I, I end the book with this um, section that, that I, you know, I worried would be a little bit controversial about how we need to kill our inner Trump. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying kill Trump, our inner Trump, the, part of, the parts of ourselves that are a little bit Trumpish, yeah. you know, and, and you know, I'm not saying that we are all the same as Trump. I'm not saying, you know, we are all equally responsible. I'm not saying that, but, but, but I am saying that he is a product of our culture, um, that he could become president is a product of our culture. And we're all in the culture and, you know, we're not at all, we don't all have the same experiences of the culture, but the same culture that, that made it possible for the United States to have its first nuclear armed reality TV star is that you know the same cultural waters uh, that are splintering our attention spans and and making so many of us think of ourselves as brands as opposed to people in communities and even our organizations to think of ourselves you know um, not as part of a broad-based social movement which needs all of our talents um, and the you know the way a social movement thinks a powerful social movement thinks is like the more the merrier, you know, like, um, and, and the way a brand thinks is very proprietary, you know, it's very like, am I going to get the credit? Am I going to, um, am I going to build my brand? And there's a real conflict. And, and, and I think it's important to, uh, to talk about this in a non-accusatory way, like, because we're products of our culture, like we may critique it, we may have a critique of it, but we're still in this system, right? And we're still products of it. This, the neoliberal project is, you know, in its fourth decade. Um, so, so, so we can, I think we can talk about this and just um, without it degenerating into kind of like you're a sellout, you're a jerk. Well, it, it is true that both things are happening at once. At the same time as we have this rankings and ratings, we also have more and more people talking about intersectionality mm -hmm. and thinking of how things are connected in non-ranked kind of ways. Mm -hmm. And we have some examples, it seems to me, of intersected agendas, if agendas is the plural, um, that are actually winning. I mean, I'm thinking of the Jeremy Corbyn outcome of the British election. Yeah. He didn't win, but he certainly surpassed everybody's expectations with a manifesto that reflected a very unranked set of priorities, except for putting the many first. Mm -hmm. The many, not the few, was his slogan. But that's important, right? That, that there was not the few. Because, <laughs> you know, like I could see the sort of Democrats going, oh, we like the for the many part, but we'll drop the for the few because we, we, we're, we're, not, we're not going to admit <clears throat> that there actually is a conflict going on, right? That, 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 there, that there are interests who are trying to, um, you know, to enrich themselves at the expense of the many. And I think that's been part of the problem, that unwillingness to kind of name names and, and, and say it's a conflict. So if he could do it, can we do it? I think so. I mean, this is the extraordinary uh, part. And, 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 and of course, Bernie Sanders did do it in, in his own way uh, because you know, he, he did name names. And he, he did say we are up against a billionaire class and there, and, and there are many more of us, right? And he did it. And one of the things I like about Bernie as a politician um, is that he is able to do that you know, without malice, um, you know, and, and, and do it in a way that is not, you know, personal, uh, but is structural. Uh, so, I, I mean, I f I'm really hardened by the, the Corbyn campaign because, because it proves that it's possible to lead with ideas, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is the antithesis of a Trump-like figure. He's, but, but more importantly to the UK, he's the antithesis of Tony Blair. He is the antithesis of 
the colonization of the political process by the logic of corporate branding. And it was Tony Blair, as you know, who was the first person to do this. You know, when I was writing No Logo and talking about the rise of this model and how it was seeping into every aspect of life, one of my examples was like, you know, in the UK, imagine talking about a political party as a brand. That was shocking that they were talking about rebranding labor because you didn't talk about And then he rebranded Britain, cool Britannia, That's right? right? Um, and you know what I wrote at the time was that, was that Tony Blair's Labor Party, New Labor, was a labor-scented party. He, had, he was severing the traditional relationship between the Labor Party and its relationship with working people. I, I, like that the, the, the brand, the logo, um, was no longer had a relationship with the product. Um, and, and, and that held, and, 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 and the elite opinion making was, well, you wouldn't actually want to have anything to do with real workers, right? Um, and then along comes Jeremy Corbyn and runs this campaign that stars workers, right? That, you know, those incredible Ken Loach films that handed the mic over, you know, to, to teachers and nurses and pediatricians. And, um, and then, you know, when that logo appears at the end, labor, it's like, oh, labor, like as in <laughs> working people. People who work. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we don't have a whole lot of time, and I want to drill down into just some of the examples that you see of this work happening today and how people are overcoming some of this brand culture to do the work that doesn't just inch us forward, but as the Canadians have said, leap us mm -hmm. um, forward. Mm -hmm. Talk about the Leap Manifesto. Why is it called that, and what's mm -hmm. in it? Right, and there are many really good examples, I think, in this country, and you know, I write, write, write about the, the vision for black lives as a just incredibly inspiring example of a, of, of a people's platform uh, that was drafted by social movements and you know when it came out uh, almost a year ago uh, you know I, like I think commentators were surprised at its ambition you know they expected the movement to only focus on police violence and it does focus on police violence but it's a sweeping vision for how to change society right um, so with with the leap that's um, that's basically what we did a year er, a year earlier when we were in the middle of a federal election campaign in Canada, uh, and we found ourselves in a situation where none of the parties that had a chance of winning that election um, were had a platform that we felt was nearly ambitious enough given uh, the overlapping crises we face. One of those crises is climate change. Another one uh, is, is the is, is racial injustice. Uh, another one is uh, the systematic betrayal of the uh, of the treaties uh, and rights of land rights of indigenous people um, and uh, you know and on and on so we we helped our, our little organization helped host a meeting of 60 movement leaders and organizers that just kind of carved out some space to dream to say okay well what do we want instead what does the world look like instead and it was really hard because we realized we didn't have most of us a muscle memory of like doing this and it's just like oh we know how to come together and say like we really don't like this trade deal or we really don't like this politician but getting into you know so we, we broke up into you know smaller groups and filled up whiteboards and all, and and um, I mean what was clear is that there was a connective tissue and 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 they, all those intersections again. yeah yeah and a lot of it had to do with care care consent um, uh, moving from a culture that is based on endless taking and disposing uh, of, of the resources of the earth, uh, of human beings, um, of pushing beyond limits as if there's no consequences, to a culture of a radical care and consent. We launched this document, it was savaged in the media, uh, in the corporate media, but you know, people continue to use it and adapt it and take it in, uh, you know, uh, whether we're hearing from a lot of people in this country who are interested in the model. It's been rewritten by groups on the Gulf South to, you know, m make it more meaningful to them. It's being rewritten at the municipal level in Canada and we have slates of candidates running. We're definitely feeling the power of a yes. And th that doesn't mean that we, we, we don't say no. Like, we have no choice. And there is such dangerous uh, policies being enacted, so much danger in this moment. Um, there, you know, these, I think, progressive ideas are more popular than they've ever been in my lifetime, but so are white supremacist ideas. So this is not about saying, like, oh, forget the no. No, we need to stand up to that at every turn. This well, is a crisis. That's my last question. I was reminded in your book of how the right come in to a crisis. 
-hmm. when you reminded me that it was Mike Pence <laughs> who was behind that post-Katrina plan to basically do away with all the protections for workers that had been put in place by activists on the Gulf Coast um, for many years. And I'm left always reading your wonderful work with this sense of how can we take advantage of yeah. crisis with as much oomph as they did? And maybe you just need to remind our audience who is Mike Pence and what it was to come across him again. Uh, well, so, so um, when I was writing The Shock Doctrine, I, you know, it, the book begins with Hurricane Katrina as the ultimate example of this tactic that the, that the book focuses on of using periods of severe collective trauma uh, to push through policies that you'd never be able to push through without a crisis because there's, because there's no consent. I mean, it's the ultimate a, uh, abuse of the principle of consent, democracy, whatever you want to call it. And New Orleans, it was, it was particularly um, abusive because people were not in their city. I mean, they were not home. They had been, many of them, you know, put onto buses and planes at gunpoint, um, given one-way tickets out of the city. And when they were gone, um, that's when their housing projects were demolished. That's when their schools were turned into charter schools or shut down completely, you know. And, and New Orleans became this laboratory for these pet ideological, very profitable uh, projects. And so there was this meeting where this was all mapped out while New Orleans, New Orleans was still partially underwater. It was at the Heritage Foundation. It was, um, it was convened by the Republican Study Group, which is a group, group of the most conservative lawmakers in Washington. I quoted extensively in the Shock Doctrine. I put the document up on my website so people could read it for themselves. There are 32 items on the wish list. And I you can put a check I reading it on the radio yeah. that night. You can put a check mark next to a lot of them today. Um, and and when, when Trump appointed Mike Pence as his running mate, I, you know, I, I knew I knew the name from somewhere, but I couldn't quite place it. And then I remembered that his name was at the bottom of that document because he was at that time the chair of the Republican Study Group. So this is why, you know, I, like, Laura, you know me, I'm not, like, I don't put out books quickly. There's, it takes me five years. And, and this book I kind of wrote in a little bit of a frenzy because I really wanted it to be out before there is a major crisis other than the crisis that is Donald Trump, right? Um, because I'm really worried about what this configuration of characters would do if they had an external shock to exploit, whether it's an economic crisis, um, you know, even, even a, a, a Katrina-like event or, um, you know, heaven forbid, a, a terrorist attack like Manchester, we, kn we saw Trump already try to take advantage of, of, of the attack in Manchester, the London Bridge attack, to say this is why we need the travel ban. There's, as bad as what they've tried to do is, there are many things they would like to do but haven't even tried yet, right? Betsy DeVos has not been able to do to the U.S. school system what she would like to do. There are many people around Trump that would like to do away with Social Security. Trump promised he wouldn't, but under cover of crisis, he would be able to say he has no choice. Um, so there has to be a plan. And, you yeah. know, I always remember that when I presented, and I, I think I've said this to you before, that when I presented the shock doctrine in New Orleans, um, uh, and that was the first city where I you know, gave a little talk about it. Sackett Sony, who I know you've had on your show, who is then based in New Orleans, said, um, you know, they have disaster capitalism, we need disaster collectivism, which is exactly what you're saying, that there needs to be uh, that confidence in moments of crisis to put forward a, transfer, a, a transformational agenda. Um, and, and, and that confidence is often missing. I think that's going to change, though, because I think, I think the movements are in a different yeah. position. We can't wait for that crisis to come up with that agenda. No, we've got to get ready. Naomi Klein, so great to see you again. Thank you so Thank much you, for the Laura. book, for revisiting some of your past work, bringing us a lot of new thoughts. The book is No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Want. More ahead. Thanks for watching. My name is Red Fawn. I am a prisoner of war. My enemies have hunted me 500 years. You know their names. They are the kings, the queens. They are all the things that are slaves to greed and power. 
My name is Red Fawn. I am just one flower. I will not die. I will not cry. I will not bend or cower. My name is Red Fawn. My people know my name. They know the sheriff's shame. And they know this governor's game. They know that I grow stronger every passing hour. My name is Red Fawn. I hear the people sing outside my window now. I hear the people. They sing my name. Hi, it's good to be able to get this opportunity. I am currently incarcerated. I was granted a furlough. I get a lot of thank you letters, but I want to say thank you to you, each and every one of you, because without you, I wouldn't have a legal team. I wouldn't have the necessities that I need. I wouldn't have the energy. I wouldn't have the strength. I wouldn't have the courage. I wouldn't be able to smile. I get these rushes of of excitement and I get happy and everybody's like what, what are you so happy about and I'm like I don't know and I know it's because each and every prayer and every energy and every time somebody sends up smoke I feel it and I'm grateful and I'm thankful and that's our life that's how I was raised that's who we are and that's how we get through the hardest times in our life so I stand strong and I stand in gratitude I'm thankful but my prayers are each and every day for each and every one of you Pilamae Medakio Yase. We are all related. Mini Uchoni. So as Naomi Klein said, it's important to know that there are alternatives and people's platforms are worth taking a look at. So I'm going to give you a glimpse of the Labour Party manifesto, the one that Jeremy Corbyn and his party ran on in the last election in the UK. It's not perfect, but it gives you a glimpse of an approach that is very different from what we have in the United States. This is the part about sustainable energy. Take a listen. One in 10 households, the Labour Party writes, are in fuel poverty, which is to say they don't have enough. Although customers are overcharged, they found an enormous two billion pounds every year. Labour, they write, understands that many people don't have time to shop around. They just want reliable and affordable energy. So the next Labour government they pledged will, one, introduce an immediate emergency price cap, can't go higher than that, to ensure that the average fuel bill remains below a certain amount, a thousand pounds a year. They'll transition to a fairer bill paying system for bill payers, and they'll take energy back into public ownership. So as they say, to deliver renewable energy, affordability, and democratic control. When was the last time you heard those three sentences in an energy plan from any government? They'll do that by, one, regaining control of energy supply networks through the alteration of the national and regional network operator license conditions. What's that mean? They'll renegotiate the contracts with the energy companies. And they'll support the creation of publicly owned, locally accountable energy companies and cooperatives to rival existing private energy suppliers with at least one in every region. They go on further to say that they will legislate to permit publicly owned local companies to purchase the regional grid infrastructure and to ensure that national and regional grid infrastructure is brought into public ownership over time. 
This is about a massive re-municipalization of things that had been privatized in the past. And it's exactly what cities in this country are just beginning to think about. In Boulder, Colorado, the people a few years back put on the ballot an initiative to take their local energy company, the Excel Energy Corporation, back into private ownership because they weren't moving fast enough to transition to renewables. That kind of conversation about taking back into public hands things that had been privatized is the kind of conversation we hadn't even started a decade back. So let's hear it for the Labour Party and let's hear it for alternatives. You can find out more and read the entire Labour Manifesto at our website and we'll put a link there too to the LEAP Manifesto that Naomi Klein talked about. Tell us what you think. You can write to me and send me your favorite people's platform. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And thanks.